Welcome back to Manum Quest New Horizons. I'm Dear Darling, as you can see what's going on on our lovely island of Horn Hollow today. And if you're wondering why the ward is there, just surrounding our entire thing, well, if it's. Wait, let me th let me think, hold on. When's this video getting uploaded? If it's your birthday today, I would stop watching your video. And if you know me, <laughs> I suppose, in real life. But yeah, um, yeah, you can see yesterday's episode for why I put up with this ward here. It's just something because I, I need it as like a, a a clue in like this escape room style sort of thing that I'm going to be helping it run with my friend. Uh, well, for my friend, not with my friend. Well, also with my other friends. But that, that's not here nor there. That's not what we're going to talk about. I don't know what we're going to talk about today. Um, I wonder if I should talk about Chicory Cut of a Tail. Because I've, I've almost finished it, but it's not quite finished, but I don't know. Hello there, everyone. I'm right now in Fawn Hall. It's 4.16pm on Friday, May 27th, 2022. It was actually a pretty uh, crazy coincidence because I finished, oh, not finished, I, I recorded some Chicory A Colourful Tale today. Um, I think I've probably recorded, like, the third last episode is my guess. Um, my, my guess is there's probably two or three more episodes, but they're not exactly going to be the most, like, thrilling episodes in the world. They're, they're going to be um, the ones where I'm just collecting basically all the collectibles I've missed throughout the entire game, which is, you know, not exactly... You, you might be like, that's not exactly the most thing, and you know, to a certain extent, I do think you're right, I do I do think it's a little bit meh, but... Vivian, please. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever had to push a villager so, so much, but I apologise, uh, Vivian, for having to push you that entire way, and everyone is trapped in here, <laughs> amusingly enough. Um, but yeah, what, what was I going to say? Um, I suppose I, I, I need to remember to, like, lock myself back in, I suppose. Um... I'll be, uh, after I finish recording this video. But, um, yeah, I, I recorded some Chikui Akada for Tail. Um, and then, you know, I refreshed my YouTube to see what was up new on my subscriptions and that sort of thing. Whoa, new Chikui Akada for Tail video was uploaded by, um, oh, what are they, what are they called? It, it's the, the, the Game Developers um, Committee, so I think it's GDC, but, yeah, GDC. New Chikui, um, video, <laughs> new Chikui video just dropped, everyone. Chikui marketing and PR post-mortem. Didn't watch it because it's an hour long. Um, that's a bit long <laughs> for me to watch about uh, uh, marketing and, well, I don't know. I guess marketing is kind of interesting, but it's not really, you know, my interest, I suppose, sales mark. Like, uh, it's not like tangentially my interest. I, I, I like the idea, well, uh, I think I like the idea of like, what makes things something marketable, I suppose. It's kind of enticing, but you know, actually, running things like social media platforms and stuff like that. As you can tell, um, not really my sort of thing, how inactive I am on, <laughs> on it most of the time. Apart from on YouTube, but it's pretty easy just to, you know, sit down, hit start record, and then just like upload the video and not have to think about it anymore. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know what I, I want to talk about in this episode today. I don't, I don't really have anything prepared. Um, I guess we can talk about something silly, but I don't really have anything silly in mind either. So it's sort of just like a, well, we're, we're going to sort of meander and talk, talk in circles until I actually think of something particularly relevant which will come up. It's nice to know we've got another Zodiac figure though. It, that's probably one of the harder things to, to actually collect throughout this entire um, game. Actually I'm not sure, is it something you can order from um, whatchamacallits? Or oh, we can put it that way, we don't need that anymore. Um, is it something you can order from a sh shopping catalogue? Because if so, then I guess that's a, just another thing which sort of entices trading with each other. Um, I don't know, what, what interesting things have happened. Um, Worms Fighting Herds come out to consoles, that's pretty cool. Um, as, I mean, you know what I think about that game, I think that's a pretty awesome game, which I don't play all that often because I don't play fighting games all that often, I suppose, in the first place. But it's a, it's a game I think is criminally, criminally underrated. It's very cool, especially with its mechanics, things like um, the dynamic music, music system. I gush on, on and on about because it's the coolest mechanism, or system I suppose I've ever seen in a game if you don't know it's basically every single character has their own style of music and every single stage has its own like baseline like melody and harmonies and that sort of thing I guess I should say every character's got a genre and basically depending on who's winning the the game the battle a bit more is whose genre and whose motifs start to appear more in the soundtrack of the game and I'm like oh that's so brilliant that's so that's so cool um I'd love to see that in more games, but obviously most other fighting games have huge rosters and Venom's Fighting Herds has like a roster of like seven, uh, which I think they're expanding up to ten or so I heard recently. So it's a criminally small um, roster, but to be fair, Skullgirls had only had like a eight strong roster until now it's got like a... Sixteen strong? I don't, I'm not really sure exactly off the top of my head, but... Oh wait, that's not really here nor there. No, I don't know, because like, um, I feel like it's... I'm not going to say it's very mainstream, but it's 
pretty common in a lot of these sort of like big games anything where you play as different characters to have huge amounts of different characters that you can play as right you know when i say this like most fighting games have huge rosters if you think about it like um I, I, like Vermin Fighting Heads and Skull Girls are definitely the smallest that I know of, but most have like uh, upwards of like twenties and thirties, I think, of characters. Um, I I can't honestly comment on how different all the characters are because I don't play that many fighting games, so it's, it's a bit difficult for me to be like, oh yeah, that, these characters are all very different. They all have very dynamic and unique move sets, which you know could be the truth. I I honestly could not tell you if that's true or not. Um, but 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 what else is I going to say? I forgot. <laughs> it's, it's difficult to say what the... Oh, heck, oh, it's a CPR, a CPR dummy. It's difficult to say, like, I wonder what the sweet spot basically is for character rosters. And I'm sure it varies on game to game. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Because, like, League of Legends, um, if you don't know, has, like, a hundred and something characters, it's, which is insane to think about. Like, I started playing the game. And I'm trying to think how many characters are when I started playing the game. I'm going to guess around 60 or something. I don't know. Someone else can do the maths. I, I started playing when Cassiopeia was released. Which was 10 years ago, which is 12 years ago almost. Oh my word. That's un honestly insane to think about. Um, but it's not like um, League of Legends is alone in the, um, the amount of ca characters it has. Um, or uh, I should say alone in its genre with having a huge amount of characters. Like Dota has quite a few. I don't know how many Dota has. I, I would guess around 80 or something. And um, I don't know what other MOBAs are even popular nowadays. Like Smite might be the only one that still kind of exists. Um, I don't even know how many Smite has, I'm going to be perfectly honest. <laughs> but, but the long shot is that uh, these these um, games are releasing characters, like, slowly but steadily. I mean, I, I think they've... I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I'd imagine they all went through a phase of basically releasing characters quite frequently. And then realising, oh, we're getting kind of like unsustainably big, we've got to slow them down a lot. And now, you know, League of Legends and Smite, at least I know, I think around four or five a year. Uh, Dota, Dota, I don't know how often they add. I, I think Dota is quite uh, infrequent. I think it might be like two year or something, two a year or something like that. But um, either way, uh, I'm not here to really comment on which one is better or worse in that sort of regard. But um, there, there certainly is some sort of happy medium of number of characters in a game because uh, on the one hand, huge amounts of character rosters, like huge character rosters, give way to basically being able to have far-reaching appeals to both aesthetically and gameplay-wise to a huge audience. Basically, you increase the audience. Hu like by magnitudes if we include more characters like um it, it's a it's a, certainly a problem with things like Vermin's Fighting Guys and Skull Girls um and, well, Skull Girls when it started out and, and kind of still around now is that um with only so many characters there's only so many like <laughs> I don't know, I was gonna say so many Venn diagrams you can put down there's only like so many circles you can put down for like different archetypes of characters and play styles that they have in the first place but eventually you're gonna have a lot of holes you know uh, things you end up missing out on because you just simply don't have enough characters to cover things and if you do have enough characters to cover things in the characters are either like way overly complex and overly designed to, to a degree that it, they're not enjoyable or not very clear about what the direction are is in the first place which you might say is kind of more reflective on you know people in themselves people are very multi-layered and that sort of thing yeah but you know generally people have a sort of direction you know I feel like most people can not quite be summarised, I suppose, in a couple of words, but you know, you can get broad strokes of their, of their character for a few, um, a couple of words. Like I don't know what you say for me. I, I guess you'd say, you know, you'd say relaxed calm, compared to something like energetic, which is just like, I mean, at times I'm sure I can be energetic, but most of the time I'm much more like um, um, I have a much more chill vibes about me. I'd say. Uh, I don't know what else you might describe <laughs> about me, but you know, I suppose that's kind of up to you, having my set. Um. So, I mean, everyone's got sort of like pointed directions for personalities and, you know, uh, directions. But I suppose more importantly and more limiting certainly is the fact that everyone must have a limited scope of gameplay mechanics, right? Because <laughs> if you put if you put a character in with too many, that covers far too many gameplay mechanics, they are probably what you'd call overloaded. They have far too many things going on for them um, and will genuinely be probably kind of overpowered. And not due to just numbers, not due to just like, you know, they like power cut people, just more of a sense that they do too many things. They're too they're good in too many different situations. And unless their like archetype is a jack of all trades, master of none, that's, you know, rife for problems. Especially um it sort of limits the scope of your expandability in the future. If you have someone which covers too many different things, it means that you can't really put someone, you can't make a new character which also covers any of those similar sort of things. If they do have to do it, they have to do it better, which, you know, I suppose is something which can very easily lead to power creep if not carefully managed, I would say. Um, 
So yeah, that's a very obvious benefit for, of expanding out of different characters. You can have you can have different archetypes. Oh yeah, you can also have different things. Um, uh, character aesthetics which you can appeal to like some people prefer very cute you know and cuddly sort of characters some people prefer cool edgy you know edgelord sort of characters which who are like badass you might say um and some characters you know some people prefer all sorts in and around and between uh what more missions do we have uh radio exercises brewster customize okay we can do those um yeah uh there's basically a huge variety of sort of things sorry i need to drink some water my throat's been very dry today But of course, a downside, and I think a major downside, which, um, well, I'm not sure people will agree with me that this is the biggest downside, but I think the biggest downside for these sort of things, if your game has enough mechanics in it, that adding more and more and more characters ends up being quite over an overwhelming learning curve, I suppose. Um, where it's got, where the initial learning curve for uh, the game becomes ridiculously high because there's just a huge amount of content for you to consume. Because not only do you have to learn the base mechanics, I suppose, surrounding the game, for example, using League of Legends as an example, you have to understand like how what lanes are, towers are, the objectives, um, the game, all of these different things on like the map and like teamwork, etc., etc. But now you have 150 or 106. I don't even know how many League of Legends has. Let's see, 100 and something characters basically, which all do reasonably different things, and you have to be able to recognize them and understand what they do. Now, obviously, this is. Um, it's kind of expected, especially when it comes to MOBAs. Any of these like um, games where you play as different characters, I feel like people are kind of expect being like, okay, it's got a huge like um, a learning curve where you basically have this giant cliff you have to ascend to even bef before you start to necessarily enjoy the game, depending on who you are, um, which is a bit of a shame, I suppose. In um, the first point, and it's something that a lot, I imagine a lot of game developers are trying to sort of skirt around. How do we basically teach us? this wall of text <laughs> to people <laughs> it's it's i'm not gonna say impossible obviously people have found ways to do it but wow it is difficult <laughs> it's all i can really say um so i, I think that's probably the, the number one sort of deficit of having such a large character roster is it's too much information i suppose I think it's compounded in, in games which are like MOBAs, things like League of Legends, Dota or whatever because you often have multiple characters in every single game, like 10 characters every single game that cycle completely to completely different characters every single time is a huge amount of information to just basically rapidly be cycling through and not a lot of time to really let it sink in. Fighting games, it depends on fighting game, it's a bit different because some, some fighting games are just one on one in which case you know it's, um, it's a lot better. Uh, especially, I, I'm not sure, I think it's a little bit different nowadays, but especially in the past I imagine a lot of fighting games didn't get as many balance updates or changes where um, once you learn one character it's sort of like you learn, you can, it's a lot easier to learn them when you learn them one by one I suppose. But to be fair, rusting game, uh, fighting game rosters tend to be a lot smaller than um, hundreds, 159 release champions in League of Legends, don't they? Um, so really, there must be a sweet spot in every single game. And every single game is kind of different as well, because you have a lot of games which do pretty well, even with a small roster. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, very, I suppose, relevant. TF2, if you, if you didn't know, there was basically this whole, um, whole movement, I think, on Twitter, where, because if you don't know, TF2 has had a bot problem. A bot problem basically being like, um, there's a huge amount of robots playing the game um, and not playing it well or ruining the experience uh, for a load of other players, especially in public lo lobbies. And it's been that way for like six years or something. And Valve, well, Valve haven't really, and Valve being recreators at too, haven't really done anything about it. <laughs> Valve, Valve don't really sort of interact with the games, and it seems like they have a very sort of hands off approach, which is, I suppose, good and bad in its own right, depending on um, what you're looking for. So to sort of drum up awareness about this entire um, debacle of the TF2 community banded together to basically get this um, Twitter hashtag to the top of Twitter. And you might have seen it, I suppose, if you were on Twitter yesterday. Um, I, I was not, so I didn't actually see it in the end, but um, it was something I heard about. I don't even remember how I heard about it exactly, but it was something I just sort of saw in passing at one point. And I was like, oh, you know, good and fun. And I actually got an official response where Valve was like, oh, we love TF2 as much as you do, something, something. Um, which is, you know, great for the attention is out there, but I, I'd imagine most of the TF2 community is sort of biting, oh, hello, bite, biting their tongues until... Um, seeing if Valve actually do anything in the first place. Which is the important part. Hello, Fauna. Um, what was that other thing? Oh, uh, radio exercises is what I had to do in customization. Um, 
Yeah, but tier two's got a, a very small roster. Like, I think nowadays you'd probably be like, wow, that's a tiny roster because you, um, I don't know if tier two really counts as a hero shooter, the same way about things like Overwatch and I suppose Siege and Valorant do. Um, because TFT only have nine characters, and you know, to be fair, TFT is a far, far earlier game than any of the, the other games I listed are, that came out, you know, 2006, I want to say. And I, I can't quite record off the top of my head, but you know, I, I was very young when I started playing. I was, I was in primary school, I think, when I started playing it, which is crazy to think about. Um, yeah, what was I going to say? Like, okay, let's do radio exercises, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see where we go from here. <laughs> I've got to put myself in. Um, okay, let's customize, and then we'll do that. I wonder, basically, if TFT was released nowadays, um, would Valve, one, go through the perspective of being like turning it into a hero shooter and basically releasing all these different classes over and over again? Or would it would, would it still have that sort of enticement, you know, for people to play it? Because another real big benefit, which I didn't bring up, um, apart from just appealing to lots of more different people, um, is the fact that you have a huge variety of different characters you can play over and over again, which is something which is Vum's Fighting Huds is criticised. Um, quite a lot for but the fact they only have seven characters means and the fact it's only one on one um well actually it's a good thing it's one on one if it's three on three even be terrible i think in that regard it's a one-on-one -on -one fighting game but you basically see the same matchups over and over and over and over again because there's only seven characters there's only so many different sort of combinations you have i mean you have seven choose two what's that that's probably like um 21 i think different uh, combinations which is not a lot to be perfectly honest um there's a huge amount more which i i feel like you could probably get done Oh, uh, Lily, you want to talk to us? Um, not right now. Let's see what Lily has to say. Hello, Lily. Um, yeah, but with League of Legends, certainly, it, it, unless you confine yourself to only one role. I mean, if you, even if you confine yourself only to one role, I think the least populated role might be 80 carries. Or Marksman, quote, quote, which has maybe like 16 or so characters. Um, you, you still have 16 characters you can play. And provided, you know, this is the provided, <laughs> that actually reasonably balanced with each other, you can sort of alternate between them as you see wish. This from a fun perspective, it's not coming from like an actual like professional or competitive perspective is a, a better word. So for a casual enjoyer, you have a variety of different champions you can play through you can to, to keep things interesting, to keep things fresh. And I forgot where I was going with this. Yeah, I, I basically wonder if like tier, tier 3 would still stick to its guns of having only 9 characters, basically. But, you know, it's also different in TF2 because in TF2 they kind of actually have, they've done a very sneaky, or well, not sneaky, but they've done a thing where they've basically got in more characters without introducing more characters, which is probably the better way to do it. But it's a thing where they, um, if you don't know how TF2 works, every single class, or most classes, have basically free equipment. They have a primary weapon, they have a secondary weapon, and they have a melee weapon. And basically um, what TF2, uh, what Valve have done for TF2's development is they basically released all these different types of weapons, which uh, sometimes change up the playstyle a little bit, or sometimes change up the playstyle a lot. Like, I've just come from, uh, I used to play Pyro, who was um, a flame for a very sort of like cr close quarters combat character. And I remember, um, at least when I started playing, uh, the, the stock flamethrower, just the normal weapons were basically the best thing to use most of the time. And then they released the degreaser, um, I, I think that's what it's called, which um, basically introduced a whole different playstyle, which is called, called like the puff and sting playstyle, <laughs> if I recall. Because basically what uh, a degreaser does is it, you do less damage with um, pyro uses flamethrowers, uh, flamethrowers <laughs> if you can guess by the name. Um, um, you do less fire damage, but the thing is you can switch between your weapons like 65% faster or something, which is crazy fast. And that uh, brought in a new meta playstyle where you can use your secondary weapon as something called a flare gun, which does bonus damage if someone's already on fire. And uh, you can use an extinguisher, which is a guaranteed critical hit if you attack someone on fire, which basically led to this puff and sting playstyle where you use the degreaser to just very quickly um, light someone up and then immediately switch to a weapon and then attack them with it. Which is very interesting. It, it, I'm not going to say it's a completely different class because um, a lot of it obviously still has overlaps. You know, you have the same speed, movement speed, you say, you have the same sort of loadouts, etc. Or in general sort of loadouts, but like health, etc, etc. Um, but it does give a very different sort of feel to it. And then they um, release something, I can't remember what it's called, it's called the flog, the flog in it, whatever, whatever. Which is basically sort of like, um, I'm not sure how to describe it, except for a very sort of reckless playstyle where basically you, as you do more damage, um, you charge up a meter and then you can activate that meter to basically get like guaranteed crit critical hits for a while which basically turns you an absolute like 
you basically have like a berserk button <laughs> where you just like absolutely go crazy for this one moment but you're very very vulnerable and then you but it takes away your air blast so you basically become like a glass cannon from what i recall and it's a very interesting thing they've done that's basically their sort of way of introducing different heroes i suppose into the game and different playstyles, but while still keeping the same nine core and i wonder i wonder I wonder, if more, for one, if anyone's done any experiments on it, but I wonder if that's more or less confusing for someone to learn, you know? Like, imagine League of Legends, instead of having 160 different characters, they had 10 archetypes, but then you could basically equip them with different abilities to turn them into different, different things. Like, you could, with basic AD carry would be like, I don't know, who's the most basic AD carry? <laughs> Lucian or something? Um, I don't really think that's true, but then it's like, oh, you know, suddenly you can, if you give him a sniper rifle, he becomes Caitlyn. I wonder if that sort of thing would be better or worse, I suppose. I th I'd imagine it becomes a lot more tenuous on how to balance things because, like, if you ch ever change, like, the base stats on a character or one of the TF2 characters, that's got a huge influence on basically every single playstyle because it inf influences every single weapon. Um, and I I'd like to have a side point here. Uh, I, I would like to know that, you know, League of Legends, Dota, and VSOC games are complicated not just for the reasons of just having a large roster size, they're also complicated, uh, re, uh, complicated because they have many different sort of, like systems interacting with each other, like uh, item systems, experience, gold, you know, monsters, etc, etc. So I, I don't mean to sort of dumb down the issue in that way. But I'm only talking about character rosters um, in itself. But I wonder if it's easier or worse, you know, the TF2 way. You know, of having just learning the base characters and then learning about all the weapons. And my hunch is it's easier because um, it sort of breaks down the steps. You like you can learn the base nine characters then, and then every single weapon that you learn about and every different playstyle sort of becomes a branch. You have something to sort of build off of, don't you? Um, and you can start to sort of figure things out from that way. But also, there's a there's a chance it becomes more complicated because things start, sort of start to blend together. When everything has distinct identities and clarities, um, you can instinctively understand what a character means. Like in League of Legends, you look at Caitlyn, you see she's got a giant sniper rifle and that sort of thing. She looks like she's got magnifying glass. She looks like an inspector, uh, a detective in that sort of regard. You understand probably her playstyle is going to be like quite long ranged or something. She's going to be some sort of sniper where, you know, she doesn't miss, <laughs> etc, etc. Compared to someone like Graves, who has like a, a double barrel shotgun and he's like much more bulkier or whatever. You sort of instinctively get the idea, oh, he's probably tanky. He's probably going to be like, I'm going to go up in your face and do my damage rather than from Caitlyn from far away. But that sort of like um, visual clarity gets muddled a bit with um, TFT. Because, uh, for example, the pirate again, um, you understand they play around with fire a lot, but the Puff and Sting sort of playstyle doesn't really play that much with fire. But most of her focus, I suppose, is on the secondary melee weapons. By the way, I might be quite ignorant, ignorant with what I say about this. I don't intend to be. It has been quite a while since I played TF2. Um, what number of missions do we have? I didn't even pay attention. Uh, ca oh, they're, all, they're all things like catching fish. Okay, let, let's catch fish, I guess. They're all things. <laughs> what kind of sentence is that? Um, but a lot of visual clarity you might, might get lost. Like, um... I suppose maybe a better example would be Sniper. Um, sniper, you understand what a Sniper is. They're, they attack from very long range, they're very precise, and they're all sort of like, um, put all of their eggs in one basket, basically hit that shot or do nothing. <laughs> and you imagine them to be very skill-based. But then you have something like a Huntsman, which is a much more sort of like medium or short range um, um, playstyle for the Hunter, uh, not the Hunter, the, the Sniper, where they sort of attack from much closer range. You know, it's like, does that sort of, because the sniper was not designed with that sort of playstyle in mind necessarily, does that sort of muddy the clarity, uh, the character design of that sort of thing? Does that matter in the end? Do people, do new players get confused? I don't really know, um, but I think it's interesting to think about because I, I would wager that having separate characters for each of these different playstyles allows you the freedom to basically have your creative team very clearly communicate what they want to communicate with a character across. You know? I guess I'm trying to think of an example. I guess maybe um, I'm thinking about it the wrong way. Because they have a certain character designs and silhouettes, it sort of limits the amount of like weapons TF, uh, the TF2 developers can actually introduce to it. Because it's not like, um, like for example, heavy. What if you wanted to have a minigun user who was, um, you know, instead of being really tanky and slow moving, they're actually, you know, surprisingly fast, but very squishy. You can't really do that. You can't make the heavy, you know, you can't give them like a minigun that suddenly is like, oh, you know, divide your health by three but you know increase your move double your movement speed or something like that <laughs> obviously that's a bit of an extreme example because the visual clarity gets confused quite a lot heavy is this absolute like 
gargantuan man, right? You know, that gives the, the impression that he's slow moving, that he's tanky, right? He'll take a hit or whatever. He's more like a, a sort of barbarian rather than someone who's swift and speedy, like, you know, the scout would. So I guess that, I wonder, basically, is what I'm trying to say, is that narrows the creative sort of scopes of what you have by the fact that you can only use these nine characters as your base rather than, you know, creating a whole new character. You know, because if it's League of Legends being like, oh, you want a tank, you want, not want a tank, but you want someone with, um, Rapid fire, or oh, I guess what would tank equipment? Someone with a lot of CC, but um, no, so someone who um, wants people to hit them, I suppose, but want, you want them to be kind of more mobile rather than but squishy at an expense. You can just create a whole new character and that sort of thing. Be like, oh, they're dodge tank or whatever, you know, and you make, I don't know, Shen or something, or Shen's, Shen's still kind of tanky, but you, you, you get what I mean, hopefully. <laughs> you, you, you have a. a the freedom, I suppose, to play around with it, because you can control all the facets of a character rather than getting lost, I suppose, within the actual character design itself. But I wonder if that actually matters at all, because really, the long and short of it, it might just be uh, people don't care about that sort of thing. It's the sort of thing where I think it's only really new people who care, which is fair, because the new people play experience is a very important experience. They're, you know, they kind of are sort of like, not the lifeblood of the game, but the lifeblood of new blood into the game. <laughs> they, they are, you, you kind of have to have continuously have new players joining otherwise you eventually you know old players eventually stop playing otherwise you'll have a player base which stagnates and slowly diminishes and gets smaller and smaller and smaller which is not exactly ideal for something you want to be um continuously popular is what i'd say um but yeah um basically i, I just sort of wonder which is better in the end and i suppose it kind of depends on the game in itself you know, it's a problem that Siege is sort of starting to run into a little bit because Siege, um, certainly what it started out as much being a much more tactical shooter, I think it didn't really have as much focus on the, the hero shooter part, but it's starting, as I understand it, people are starting to say it's slowly becoming more and more like a hero shooter rather than the tactical um, shooter that people uh, are much more aware of when it comes to Siege. Whether it's bad or good, I suppose it sort of depends on your own personal taste when it comes to these sort of games. Um, I quite like a hero shooter aspect, but it's a sort of, sort of thing where because a lot of the characters don't have huge amounts of different skill expression, um, not skill expression in the first place is what I mean, but like there's not much differentiating them apart from their gadgets. I, I wonder if it, now the overlap is starting to get a little bit like tenuous between them. <laughs> it's starting to introduce, I wonder if it's starting to introduce too much complexity for new players, even more so um, than is necessary. And honestly, I don't really have an answer for you there. I think that's really up to the Siege team to decide rather than for me, but I do wonder, basically. And, and I just do wonder if it's like, if it's a good or bad thing necessarily. And I think you'd find a lot of people debating about it. I'm sure some people love it and some people hate it. I do kind of like it, but I, I do wonder for the longevity of the game because it's already a very complicated system, I suppose. Introducing more and more hero characters on top of it, where really I think it's called delight, I suppose. Um, lies in the, the fact of it's got its destructibility and all that sort of thing in the first place. I wonder if that's really um, the direction it should be going in. And honestly, I don't know. That's all I can really say. But um, on this note, we're going to round off this episode here. Uh, I think it's an interesting point of discussion. I don't really know um, what the answers is, really, to be to be sure. I think that's something you kind of had to survey people to really answer about. But yeah, um, I'm going to round off this episode here. So if you have been watching, thank you very much. It's been Animal Crossing New Horizons. I've been Dear Darling. Any likes, comments, subscription shares are greatly appreciated. Join me, Dear Darling, Discord, follow me, and down below. Hope we can see each other again. But for now, it's our farewell. So until next time, bye bye for now. <laughs>